First of all, thanks guys. Thanks for inviting me down. I, I really um, feel quite honoured because I didn't think I'd be in this sort of position any time in my life, to be honest. I've uh, had a lot of careers, I've done a lot of things, but this is not one of them that I really look forward to, but I'm really happy to be here. And it's been, it's actually been quite a great day. I've really enjoyed everything that's come from today so far. But, um, uh, my story is sort of, um, it's probably different to a lot of people who will experience it here. Uh, you guys being fully commercial beekeepers, I was sort of on the sideline. I, um, I, I bred queens for my own purpose and to actually sell to other people, and that was my passion, was queens. We had a... Uh, a um, I worked commercially for an, another uh, beekeeper who had 1,500 colonies, so I was certainly well aware of the, uh, the lifting boxes and all the sort of stuff that goes along with beekeeping and, and things like that. But um, I really wasn't prepared for the day that actually happened and come along. Um, so just a short background, I grew up in a New South Wales farming community. I went on to become a, a builder, then I was a policeman in a, a detective for a, a number of years. Gemologist, I've had heaps of different careers. Uh, import, wholesale, retail, um, a, a sort of with my, my wife, and, and unlike Steve, I have a wife. So, um, <laughs> and, and I'm really trying to keep her so I won't do what he does. The, um, like, and from there, we, we went back to the land. So I bought a property which is mainly citrus, uh, and we needed bees for pollination. We had bush foods, we had... And we basically were having a problem with the fruit. So I, I went back to the bees, uh, like growing up, one side of my family was beekeeping, the other side was beef farming. And I always went with my dad, which was the beef farming side, and left the other side alone. But... <clears throat> Uh, it it became an obsession, and then I uh, did the like the Cert three in beekeeping. I did all the courses that Toco had to offer. I did the queen breeding. I did the artificial insemination. I bought my bread of queens off Joe Horner. I, I created quite a good little business that I had coming along, and then we got Varroa. So I, I sort of put everything on hold, and just sat there and waited to see what would happen. And and I thought sooner or later it would catch up with us but I didn't think it would catch up as quick as it actually did to me. So, uh, so in, in the meantime, I, I was approached by TAFE New South Wales to teach beekeeping, which I, I went on to do. So I was teaching, um, you know, and as much as you guys hate it, they, there's a lot of people out there who just have a thirst for beekeeping and, and to be able to teach them the correct way to, to, to beekeep and to, for pests and diseases and things like that was my passion. And to actually... Um, just to, to pass on the skills that I've actually, I got from a lot of very good mentors, some very old mentors, and it was, uh, the best thing I could do was to give those skills and those knowledge to someone else, so I did. And then at the bottom of the air, I, I sort of hope one day that I'll, I'll retire. So uh, that, that's what I'm looking forward to one day. But, but other than the, for the, the pollination of our orchard, the, uh, the queen bee production, I sold a lot of nucleus hives, so I, I, um, I sold a lot of bees. I had no real interest in honey because I, I always thought it was, like, you know, hev heavy, sticky shit that I didn't really want to be involved in. So I, I concentrated on the bees and that's where I wanted to be. And I created a, a training apiary for, for Kempsey um, where I, I put bees down at the apiary and we taught basically the, the TAFE students plus um, I was part of the, uh, the formation of the Amateur Beekeeper Association for the Maclay Valley uh, in Kempsey. So... But other than that, the commercial reasons out of the way, the bees, at the end of the day, they were everything to me. I knew every queen that was in, that, in those colonies. I sort of... Um, it, um, it was hard the day that they were actually all taken away. And, and you guys got... You don't have to go through that. But, I mean, it's, it's, it was difficult. But I'll get past that in a minute. So I, I, I sort of look at that and I go that... Um, I try to work it out. So on the 12th of August... I decided I was going to go out and I had some new testing equipment. I had some, um, so I wanted to test the fairy, the dishwashing liquid, and all the different things that had been thrown at us to test for Varroa really, to me, didn't seem to fit the bill of actually finding Varroa. It was more to just go through the actual testing phase of um, 
you know, I put up tick a box, I tested, I got nil. Um, I was happy and I've got nil and there's nothing I can do about it because I've reported that to the DPI. So I created these um, new test containers which are basically uh, one kilo honey jars. They have a, a three mil mesh, stainless steel mesh in the, the second one. And it, so I, in a lid, so I put my 300 bees in there, put the lid on top, and then I have a second one kilo honey bucket that it sits in, and then you can actually, you can watch the mites just fall from the, the, the actual solution with the sugar, but not for the sugar, with the um, soap. You can just watch them, they just like confetti, they just drop off. You don't even have to shake or do anything like that. So, and I, like I've shown that to a few people that have been up to Kempsey and they just go, wow, you should actually um, patent that. But, I mean, I'm happy for you guys to copy that, that design and to find your mites. So, looking through that slide there, there's, you know, the, the start of the test with the fairy and the, the two containers, the bees in the solution, and there's some mites in that one, but that's not the one from the day, but that little bugger there in the blue... He's the one that caused me all the drama on that day, on the 12th of August, 2023. And uh, I, I probably, um, I do regret sometimes actually going out that day and finding it, but so here's the, the, the end result of, of that day. So um, I went through a lot of uh, twos and throws. Should I report it? Should I not report it? Um, I, I got another mate of mine over who's a... a commercial beekeeper, we discussed it, and uh, the decision was left up to me, so on that day I actually did, I rang up and I reported the mite to the DPI, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, because if you think about hindsight, by reporting that mite that day, um, you guys had a, you've had a year's grace from what I can pretty well understand, because the, uh, we had with Kempsey beekeepers, we had hives at uh, Tamworth, um, we had them at um, Narrabri, Cutterbri, down the, the almonds, and they were sort of spread everywhere at that stage. And nearly all of those bees, those loads of bees, actually tested positive to varroa mite. And that was at that stage the containment was on and the eradication was on, so everything was contained. And I think to this date, and it seems to have grown a little bit, but at this stage the, those containment lines have sort of held and it's saved the rest of Australia from getting mites uh, at least. Um, it's, at least it's, it's given you a 12-month grace to, to work out what you need to do and how you can test and, and basically what chemicals we can use and what um, organic methods we can use and how we can treat the mites and given education time to actually catch up to what we actually had. So there's just a, a general, um, you know, a feeling of the day, all our boxes. I don't know, some of you guys I know were involved in the eradication process for New South Wales DPI. And the, it was just a matter of the bees being wrapped up in the, or turned over, filled with um, some uh, petrol on the, through a, a cloth through the top of them and the hives were euthanised and then they were wrapped and, and left there for a truck to come along, pick them up and take them to the tip and just dump them in a hole that was actually buried at one of the local tips. So the, the, I look at these pictures the other day and I think, God, we were in drought. There was, there was, the grass is horrible. It's like, not like down here at the moment, it's green everywhere. But the, the one on the, um, the left-hand side there, that's, just, that's my breeders were up the top and every one of those were actually euthanised and... Um, you know, I probably uh, I probably should have kept them. They did offer me that position where I could put them in the the um, the high value queen sort of bank and and keep them. But I didn't. I just thought it was best at that stage that everything be euthanised uh, for the benefit um, of um, for everyone. I, I was better off to actually cut my losses, um, let them euthanise the bees, and hopefully that would stop the spread of varroa. And to be really honest, if I go back to the first um, slide, if I went back to the other slide, that was the only mite I found. The, um, so I went across to the hives and uh, I did this test and I, I, you know, put it in and I found one mite in that whole wash. And I looked at it and I just thought, oh, no, that can't be true. And then uh, I went across, but 
after I reported it, the DPI turned up, as in, and that's another different story. A lot of things happened in between that time because it was the night the Matildas were playing, so I couldn't get anyone to answer a phone, so I couldn't get a, a result from anyone, and the, the whole um, emergency line was basically um, turned off because the Matildas were playing soccer that night, so I couldn't report it. But, but that one mite, the, the DPI turned up, they rewashed that colony. There was not one more mite that was picked up in a wash. They, they did all the other colonies that I had there. They picked up one more white mite in a wash and then everything was matted and uh, vapor oil strips were put in. And the, that hive that I found the mite in, I think there was only a few that were actually found on the mat after the, the two days. So it was either a matter of you know really bad luck or good luck. I couldn't work out what it was that I really shouldn't have found that mite on that day, and that would have been perfect for, for me, but not so great for everyone else. So getting past those guys, so, so why did I report it? And, um, and you guys have got to go through this same thing. And, and I, it's, it's ethical. Um, morally, I have this compass that points north and it really annoys me sometimes. I just sort of have to tell the right thing and I, I don't know why it is, but it's, as you explained tonight with um, Ag Vic, it's, it's lawful. You actually have to report it. So if you're caught out with mites, or like a large volume of mites, and you haven't reported it and you've reported your washes, um, and not that anyone's been prosecuted in New South Wales, but maybe that will happen in Victoria. I probably doubt it very much, but it's, <laughs> it's just one of those things. The, um, so the real, my idea was that I'd slow, it, slow the spread of the varroa mite down. I would help eradicate the mite, even though I was a really strong uh, voice for it. It will never happen, because if you understand the biology of mites, it's just something that will never happen. Like once you get a mite, you just you've only got to have one left in the environment and you can't stop them. They'll just she'll breed, she'll lay her son, the son will dope the daughters and then it'll start again. So there's no real way of actually stopping the varroa once it gets to you. So you're better off reporting and actually starting your testing regime or, or doing something about it. So as I said, either good luck or bad luck, I'm I'm not quite really what sure it was. And would I do it again? I, I really think I probably would. Um, I'd, I'd probably toss it a little bit longer over it and make it, and I'd get past the Matilda's night. I'd probably do it the next day and see what actually happened. But I, I probably would report it again, just for the sheer fact that I think it's the right thing to do. Here's, um, here's a picture of, uh, I don't know if anyone knows Kevin Tracy. Kevin Tracy used to be the, the, one of the instructors down at Tokal. So he turned up at our place to, not long ago to go through the testing, um, the washers for mites, and he, he did his, um, well, I showed him one of the colonies and he picked it up, and I think this one had something like 130 mites in it in the wash. So he just sat there and looked at it, and that's the face that he pulled as soon as he saw it. It's, um, you really need to test all the time. Don't wait for your 16 weeks. I know it's, they tell you to, to you guys down here are still on the same as us, where you do the, you know, test twice a year and report. You need to be doing it more often than that because once the varroa actually gets established, it, it will build up really quickly and you won't even notice that it's there and then all of a sudden it'll just go bang and your hive will have like a 40, 50 cent mite count in the actual, in the wash. The... Um, Yeah, the, the, uh, I struggle with uh, There's a lot of people who would like to be um, uh, chemical-free or um, treatment-free beekeepers, and, and I probably used to be close to that. Like, I did come up with an, an intro pest management plan that I really wanted to use that would probably not uh, have to use the chemicals. And I'm, I'm sorry, guys, but it's not something that will probably happen for a short time. You will have to use those chemicals. And there's no way you'll be able to stop the mites from reinfestation once they actually start. So you have to get your head around being able to control the mites and have some sort of plan ready for them. And I've had more than one integrated pest management plan since I've started looking at the mites. Uh, they I originally started off where if I would have... Um, you know, uh, to put you back in the picture, and, and some people might not like what I'm about to say, but when I first got varroa mites I, I, and all my colonies were destroyed or euthanised, 
I still had an orchard to support. So I had, um, you know, 6,000 trees there that needed pollination. And at this stage, there was not one bee left in the whole area of where I was. So uh, I, also, I risked um, losing that position. I, risked, I lost my bees. I lost my queens. I, um, I also risked losing my position where I was teaching at TAFE because no bees, no job, no, you know, no one wanted to do beekeeping. But I brought bees back from uh, out of the area where they had no varroa mites and after a, a set period of time, I rang, because we were on a process where we could get free varroa um, bay roll strips, and uh, so I logged in, recorded my washes, asked for my bay roll strips so I could actually treat my hives, and uh, to and fro and come around, and in the end, the, um, the, uh, the supervisor from that area rang, he said, Peter, I'm really sorry, but the um, DPI have decided because you bought hives that were cleaned back into a red area, you're not entitled to bay roll strips and to look after yourself. I, I teach a lot to, um, to beekeepers up there because I run a, a varroa resilience sort of course. And the best thing you guys have got at the moment is this Honey Bee Health Coalition. I really, and it's a part of your um, package that you got today or yesterday in, in your, um, your bag, but you really need to go in and learn to use that varroa management decision tool. Does it, has anyone tried that, Use it? No one? No. Yeah, it is the best tool to get your head around Varroa that you'll actually be able to go in and use. So you can go into there, it'll go through a series of processes. So um, Honeybee Health Coalition is an American based, um, that, that's their um, website for help beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, look after their pests and diseases, their pollination, etc., etc. But there's a decision tool in there which gives you the option to go in and say, OK, uh, have I got the mites? Have I tested? Is my threshold low or high? You go, yes. If it's you know, higher than what it should be, then it'll go on to other screens. It's just like a prompting to take you all the way through. Um, the uh, things like, uh, and, and then they'll jump on to, are you uh, prepared to use um, like... Uh, chemical or um, organic sort of treatments. If you tick both of them, just tick both because you get all the options. And then a brood present is uh, honey supers on. Um, is your population on the increase or the decrease so at this or, or, um, or at peak? So if you're looking at you know, your spring, summer, it's at peak and down here where we are, it's on the decrease. And you, you tick all those boxes and then all of a sudden it'll give you a complete list of what treatments you should be using or what's available for you. So you can look at through them and one of the best, like if you look at, there's one on the screen there for uh, Formic Pro, well then it'll bring up an actual full screen on how to use Formic Pro, when you should use Formic Pro, all the information you need to know about Formic Pro and you can click on the top or the bottom corner and it'll actually show you a video on how to actually install Formic Pro. So it's one of the best tools you've got at the moment and you should be, even though you haven't got much, you should be sitting there practising with it every chance you've got because it'll give you some understanding of what you can actually do to manage your mites. The, uh, just on the Formic Pro, I, I, I use, I can take you through the, what I've done so far and uh, it hasn't, um, th there's been some ups and downs for me so I, I decided to do the Formic Pro. We had um, Ecrotech come up. We've had a few different people come up, give some great talks. Um, Lockwood's in relation to treatments and what we can do. And uh, Formic Pro seemed to stand out for me as an organic treatment that I could use when I had honey supers on, because we always have honey supers on. We sort of really can't get away from it. And I put the Formic Pro in, and the Formic Pro is a, a particularly nasty um, fumigation method to, to control the mites. So, You've got to give them a lot of space. It, it really, it rusted my queen excluders, it rusted my hive straps. It um, really affected all the bees who had mite bites in them because our mite loads were really high. We were picking up like 180, 200 mites in a wash and, we, and that was just reinfestation. Like it was just coming in like we couldn't control them. So all those bees that had um, mite bites in them or where the mites were feeding on, the, the Formic Pro actually really affected those bees and it affected the, the brood, and um, I thought, oh, well, I'll put up that. So I did, and I, then I decided to, um, 
I thought, well, that's my um, my autumn preparation. I thought it was time to you know to put all the bees to bed and everything be wonderful. And I'd you know I'd go back and check on them again when I get to spring, and they'd be they'd be perfect. But I checked it two weeks later, and I had counts of like um, 80, 120, 180. That was reinfestation. So that was just colonies that were collapsing outside of my area. And because the Formic Pro only lasts for either 10 or 20 days in, in its treatment, if you use um, two strips, it's 10 days. If you use um, one strip and then another strip, it, it takes you on to the 20 days, or seven days, 20 days. But after that 20 days or the 10 days had finished, the, the, the mites were just having a field day. They were flying back in. I couldn't stop them, and there was nothing left in the colonies to stop the mites from reinfesting the actual bees. So I've had to um, to go to the Baverol strips, and the and the only way I can control the reinfestation now is to to use the Baverol strips. And I was uh, really hoping that the my Baverol strips are nearly soon are due to to come out soon. I was really hoping that uh, oxalic acid would be approved, and I would have a chance to put in the the extended release strips to put on top because if I if I don't have those strips well then I've got to look at something else and it will either have to be another chemical and look I, I hate to sorry say this but there's you know there's people that are actually doing um, back to back treatments in Bayroll because it's the only way that they can stop the mites from reinfesting their colonies. Um, I've, I've been I've been lucky enough to be involved in a, a project with Ian Kane and um, B Wright and um, DAF from Canberra, where we've, this is the second round now, where we've actually put, um, we've left the colonies untreated for two months, but in that whole treatment I kept one that had a Baverol treatment in it as a control. We did 150 colonies. And if you look at this slide here, this is really interesting because the constant thing I get from beekeepers is that alcohol washes are a waste of time. There's no need to do an alcohol wash. They're, you know, they, they, they're irrelevant, that you get nothing out of them. So if we look at this one here, and the, you've got the blue is the actual alcohol washes and the mite washes and the mites we found in the alcohol wash. The red one is actually after we'd finished the project, we put the bay roll strips in, and that's the counts that come from the mites that fell onto the mat. So if you look at those two line graphs, you can see the correlation between the, the actual... Um, alcohol, we, well, I, that was alcohol testing because it had to be done through DAF and they had to be all done at exactly the same. But there's no difference in that line graph. So you can actually see that the alcohol washes or the soap washes do work. And I really, really think you should find and, and, and forget what everyone says because they do work. It's, it's just a myth. If we look at those numbers there, so... Um, I don't know if you can have a have a quick look at the at hive number. Um, there's only ten on there, but if you look at number, oh, it's number seven on the. Um, I've got a couple. Of, I bought a couple of mats, and I I did get permission from uh, Agvic to bring these down. And I've got the one here that actually is um, had the baby roll strip in it for the the test period for the eight weeks, and it actually ended up with a a, a wash of three in the and a um, 136. And the other one is from, high, it's from um, number six, and it ended up with, it had 140 in the wash, which wasn't the big wash we had. The biggest wash we had was 190. You can pass them around if you want to. Don't try and pick the mites, they're all dead, so you, there's no use taking them home and putting them in your test. The, the, um, the biggest one we had was actually 190 mites in a 300B wash. And this is the problem. I know Newcastle's having the same issue. Uh, I'm not quite sure about out west, but John will probably tell us when he gets up how they're going out there. But for us in Kempsey, it's impossible to keep bees without that reinfestation. And I, I sort of, um, I feel sorry for you in a little bit of a way because you guys have got that to happen in the future. And um, it's, it's not enjoyable. So you um, I quite often see it on Facebook on the commercial side where they wish that everyone could get Varroa and let's all get involved in that. But I think my personal opinion is the longer you can keep it away, the better you're going to be and the more prepared you'll be for what you've actually got coming. There's a, a basic um, a rundown of what those 10 colonies went through. So... 
on the uh, 7th of March, they, or 21st of March, they had formic pro put in them as a treatment, which I basically, I didn't even test them then, but it would have taken them down to like two or three mites. And then we get to the end, which is um, eight weeks later, and we've got numbers ranging from 190 down to the three. And uh, the, um, you, you know, like 10,739 on a mat, which is a, a hell of a lot of mites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it don't, don't, it doesn't, for most people who see mites, it doesn't seem like a lot these days, but it, it happens. Um, <laughs> Is that right, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's just a, a, like a, a pickup of the actual, that's the one that had the bay roll strips in it. So you're looking at, you know, 1% threshold. Um, it had 136 on, on the mat. So basically my bay roll treatment kept that colony below threshold. And it would have been right to, I just had, I have to find something else to put in it now because I really can't put another bay roll strip in it because I will actually give the mites of an opportunity to build up resistance, and that's not really what um, the idea of the, the, the whole thing is. Um, this is the the one that you, you've got there with the 10,739 mites on it, and trust me, it took guys nearly um, something like three hours to count the mites that are on those mats and like per mat and we had 150 of them to count through and he's done a report now in relation to um the, the be right program and basically the um you know the the effectiveness of the actual devices that were put in and you know what information could be gleaned from those that, those devices uh, just a quick pic, uh, like a picture. There's a two dollar coin, so it gives you some indication. I, w I wasn't going to bring the mites, but I actually thought, well, I, I've sealed them. I can bring them down, and Agvic were kind enough to actually let me let me keep them here. But I will take them home. I promise. So yeah, I won't leave them here. And pretty well, my whole thing with you guys, and I really, I, I can't stress it enough. I was sort of, I had my head buried in the sand for a, for a year thinking that, you know, it's going to take years for this thing to turn up at our place because, you know, if you think about the spread, it was two to three kilometres a year, like basically crawled along and we, we had heaps of time. But it seemed to... Um, I think it's been in Kempsey for a lot longer than what we uh, initially... Well, a lot longer than... Let's just say it was probably not discovered... Uh, as when it was <laughs> when it was there is probably an easy way to put it, <clears throat> and it's it's probably caused us problems because if we reported it earlier, we could have treated and we we could have actually um, we would have got to that stage of um, probably transition to management a lot quicker than what we actually did because it would have actually got, been found in another location, and we could have stopped some of that spread and stopped some of that um, reinfestation and hopefully. You know, just tamed it down a little bit, but because no one reported or no one really tested, I, I can't say that because there was no um, n no no mites reported. We've been left with this position now that we're sitting in an absolute red zone. That's a, a minefield, and I, I hope that you guys really don't go through the same as what we did up there. Um, 